Good afternoon, and welcome to our session on uh, evolving the security of the Java platform. My name is Frances Ho. I manage the Java Security Engineering Group here at Oracle. This group consists of a Java Security Libraries team as well as the Vulnerability team. And my co-speaker here is Brad Wetmore. Brad is a veteran in the Java Security Libraries team. He has significant experience in Java's TLS implementation as well as the JCA framework. Brad also has a background in networking. Here is the agenda for this session. I will start with the goal of this talk and what we will cover today. I will then do a quick overview of the Java security and talk a little bit about how we do our work through the OpenJDK project. Hopefully, most of you are familiar with the primary components and features of Java security. This will be very helpful background information for the rest of the session. I will then discuss the motivation and the importance of evolving the security of the platform. After that, I will hand it over to Brad, who will discuss some security features that we have added recently and how they each play an important part in the evolution. Next, I will go over the Java Crypto Roadmap, which is how we inform the public on upcoming security changes. I will also talk about some interesting projects that we're investigating for potential inclusion into our future releases. And finally, we'll open it up for Q&A at the end if there is time. Okay, the goal of this session is help you understand how we evolve the cryptographic features of the Java platform so that you can build and deploy applications that use modern and strong algorithm and protocols. But before we discuss this in more detail, let's go over the primary components and the key features of Java security technology. Java security consists of language and runtime security functionality, along with a comprehensive set of APIs and implementations that cover many different areas. The high level abstractions are built on top of lower layer concepts, as you can see in the brick, uh, brick wall diagram here. At the bottom layer, the Java language was designed to be type safe and easy to use. It has a lot of features for free such as memory management, garbage collection, and range checking on arrays. This reduces the overall programming burden for developers, leading to fewer subtle programming errors and safer and more robust code. A compiler translates Java program into a machine-independent bytecode representation. A bytecode verifier will then ensure that only legitimate bytecodes are executed in the Java runtime. It checks that the bytecodes conform to the Java language specification and do not violate Java language rules or namespace restriction. The verifier also checks for memory management violation, stack underflow or overflows, and illegal data typecast. Once the bytecodes have been verified, the Java runtime prepares them for execution. There is also the usual access modifiers that can be assigned to classes, methods, and fields, restricting access to class components as needed. For example, private, protected, package private, and public. In JDK 9, we add a support for modules, but that is out of scope for today's discussion. The foundation of Java security is based on cryptography. The cryptography component contains APIs for various crypto primitives such as message digest, ciphers, signature, key agreements, and so forth. The JDK supports standard algorithms for each of these primitives. For example, SHA-2 for message digest and AES for ciphers. The PKI component contains APIs and implementations for validating and building certification paths and storage of keys and certificates. The transport layer security component contains API and implementations for TLS, which is the successor to SSL and DTLS. The XML signature component contains an API Im implementation for generating and validating XML signatures. 
The JGSS, SASL, and JAZZ are a series of frameworks and APIs for authentication and authorization. The most popular mechanism is Kerberos. Sign jars allows you to supply a digital signature to a jar file to provide data integrity and authenticity. The security manager is a feature that was originally designed as a sandbox for running untrusted applets. It was later enhanced to support a fine-grained permission model, but was never widely used. And it's now deprecated in JDK 19 for removal. We also support a small set of tools, key tool, jar signer, and some Kerberos related tools. Most of the cryptographic components follow the JCA architecture, where the implementation algorithms are made available by security providers. The APIs are abstract and allow for multiple implementations of algorithms. Algorithms are implemented in service providers and plug in via a standard service provider interface, SPI. Regardless of the implementation, whether it is Oracle or a third-party provider, the same APIs are called by the application. The architecture allows for implementation independence, interoperability, and algorithm extensibility. The APIs are a work in progress as we identify some features that don't fit well in the existing APIs. We are looking into creating new ones in the near future. So to give you a better idea how the provider mechanism works in this example here, let's assume three providers are registered with the JDK named provider A, provider B, and provider C. And they all provide different SHA variants to applications. And let's say an application wants to use SHA-256. So it calls into the JCA provider framework to find a SHA-256 implementation instance that it can use. The first provider, provider A, advertises a SHA-384 and a SHA-512 implementation, no SHA-256. So the framework will now have to proceed to the next register provider, which is provider B. And this provider has a SHA-256 plus an alternate ver version of SHA-384. So the framework will now instantiate an instance of its SHA-256 and then returns it to the application. The application will then provide the bytes to, the, to be digested and obtain the final message digest bytes. The JDK does include a default set of service providers covering a broad, comprehensive set of algorithms, which is continually being updated and is the focus of today's presentation. Since 2007, the JDK has been developed as an open source project, OpenJDK. And today, almost everything that we implement in the security area is open source. The one exception is for verifying third-party JCE providers. If you use Oracle's JDK and a non-JDK crypto provider is supplying encryption algorithm, for example, ciphers, key agreements, or Macs, export compliance requires that third-party JCE providers used within the JCE framework be signed with a certificate issued by the Oracle JCE Certificate Authority. There is a process for obtaining these certificates that will take several days, which requires you to certify that your provider will follow all appropriate export regulations. So be sure to allow enough time to obtain one of these certificates. Be aware that some OpenJDK-based implementation do not require such a certificate. Also note that a certificate received from this process will not work for anything other than authenticating JCE providers to the JCE framework. That is, you cannot use the certificate as a general purpose co-signing certificate for authentication or as the basis of making security policy decisions. The OpenJDK security group consists of Oracle and other external developers who participate in the design implementation, and maintenance of Java security components. The OpenJDK security group listed here is the entry point for learning about the group and its activities 
such as who we are and what, how we do things. There is also a dev mailing list listed there, which anyone can join and participate. We do all of our co-review in the open. We also have recently done a couple of surveys to get more developer feedback on future projects. We use the JET process, just like the rest of the JDK, for significant security features or enhancements. Here is a list of some of the more recent ones since JDK 11. But many other smaller but equally important enhancements are made to the JDK and do not have a JEP. These generally go through the Compatibility and Specification Review, CSR, process, which is described more fully in the Open JDK project documentation. So some contributors to Java security include Azul, Oracle, Red Hat, SAP, Tencent, and many others. So in this section, I will discuss why it is important to continuously evolve the security features of the Java platform. If you work on security technologies, you're probably aware that cryptographic landscape changed at a very fast pace. Most, if not all, algorithms weaken over time and can then be exploited more easily. Just as a few example, MD5 was published in 1992 and the first weakness was found only four years later. SHA-1 was published in 1995, and the first weakness was reported 10 years later. RSA is still considered a secure algorithm. However, every few years, an RSA with a larger key size is factored, with the most recent one in 2020 for a 829-bit key. Today, it is generally recommended to use RSA key size of 2048-bit or larger. The good news is that stronger algorithms and protocols are continuously being created to replace or sometimes provide an alternative to the old ones. I mentioned MD5 and SHA-1 earlier. So SHA-2 was introduced in 2001 and more recently SHA-3 in 2016. SHA-3 is not designed to replace SHA-2, but more as an alternative to use in the event that SHA-2 uh, would be broken. Symmetric key algorithms have also gone through a similar transformation. And this pattern is also seen in security protocols. For example, we disabled TLS 1.0 and 1.1 by default in April of 2021 as the industry has widely adopted TLS 1.2 and is now moving towards TLS 1.3, which provides additional protection and much better performance. There is also the potential threat of quantum computers and that in the sometimes in the not so distant future, they will be able to break cryptographic algorithms that are considered secure today. Thankfully, the industry has been working toward the goal of creating post-quantum cryptographic algorithms that are safe against an attack by either a quantum or a classical computer. We are tracking these efforts and the proposed standards as they progress and mature. On the flip side, the lifetime of a JDK release can outlast the viable lifetime of many crypto algorithms. Case in point, the support lifetime of JDK 8 will potentially spend more than 16 years, which is more than the lifetime of many crypto algorithms. Therefore, we must continuously make improvement to the cryptographic algorithms and protocols supported by the platform. Another important motiva motivating factor for evolving security is native integration. Some operating systems restrict access to credentials, for example, private keys. So integration with platform API is very important. And some important platform API includes PKCS 11, Windows MS CAPI, and Windows SSPI. So in summary, here are some of the primary guiding principles that influence us when evolving Java security. First, we must continue to adapt to the dynamic security threat landscape 
by adding support for stronger algorithms and protocols so that you as a developer can have confidence that the Java platform will continue to provide a strong cryptographical foundation for your development. Second, we will strive to provide a secure environment for your applications. We will disable weak algorithms and protocols by default and establish strong default and make them even stronger over time. We will leverage native and OS specific features to allow your application to take advantage of native credentials and other security information. And finally, we will provide you with the tools that help you diagnose the security of your application to determine if you may be at risk. Brad now will go over some of the new security features we have added to the platform. Thank you, Francis. So as um, Francis has already kind of alluded to, now that you know what some of our motivations and our uh, guiding principles are, let's take a look at some of the features and get into kind of the nuts and bolts, if you will. So the first principle that we talked about was um, adding support for stronger algorithms and protocols. So here is a list of some of the main uh, crypto algorithms that we're supporting now that uh, provide a lot of um, uh, security. And uh, for example, Message Digest, we talked about SHA-2 and SHA-3. Um, those are relatively recent, although SHA-2 is in the 2000s. Um, but uh, for ciphers, we also have the authenticated data uh, encryption with uh, associated data ciphers like the AES GCM and also the CHA-CHA-20 Poly 1305, which is a relatively new cipher as well. Uh, we also have um, a mode where you can use uh, uh, PBE, uh, PBES2, which is a password-based encryption algorithm, which uh, is also based on uh, PBKDF2. For digital signatures, we've got a whole uh, alphabet soup up there, uh, RSA, SSA, PSS, which is a probabilistic uh, algorithm. Uh, we also have uh, elliptic curve DSA as well as uh, Edward curve DSA. Those are all used for different kinds of uh, signatures. We also have some MAC algorithms. So we have um, hash-based uh, MAC, uh, HMAC SHA-2 and HMAC SHA-3, which uh, take a checksum and then use uh, uh, at, like a SHA-3 checksum and then apply HMAC to it. Uh, we have other key agreement algorithms like elliptic curve DH and also the new X XDH uh, algorithms, which are based on the curves 25519 and X448. Uh, we also have uh, the new DRBG, the Deterministic Random Bit Generator, uh, which is put out by NIST. So we have all of these things which are uh, pretty, um, pretty nice to have in um, most modern applications. So above all these cryptographic primitives, we also have protocols that are built on top of those. And so, for example, uh, we have TLS 1.3, which is the most recent version of TLS. Um, we currently have TLS 1.3 and 1.2 as kind of our main uh, enabled algorithms. We'll talk a little bit about the disabled ones in a little bit. Uh, we also use PKCS 12 as the default key store type now in JDK. Um, and it's using PBES 2 based on SHA-2 and AES. So, and then lastly, we've also bumped our uh, PKCS level support up to level 3, or version 3. So the second principle that we talked about is providing a secure environment. Well, it's great to have these new algorithms. What about the old ones? So not only do we add the new ones, uh, it takes continuous effort to keep up to date and on the existing algorithms that are becoming obsolete and weak. So in the past few years, we've already disabled DES and triple DES, uh, MD2, MD5, the message uh, digest. RSA and DSA are OK, but if you're using small key lengths, that's not very good. Um, especially when they're used in X509 certificates or XML signatures or signed jars, any of those situations. Um, we have disabled by default TLS1 and TLS1.1 in April 2021, and DTLS is now disabled as of JDK20. Um, in other areas, we've also disabled some of the SASL mechanisms based on the old legacy hash algorithms, um, and triple DES, such as triple DES and RC4. Um, that was done uh, last October as well. So please note that all the cryptographic primitives are still available for use. You just can't use them in some of the higher level abstractions like TLS or SASL or CertPath. So, uh, and how do we do that? We actually have security properties that we have in a file called java.security, and that is where we control what algorithms are available for use. Um, you can always add more algorithms to these files if you want to disable them, or if you 
God forbid, want to re-enable them, you can take them out. So just be careful if you do that. Um, we don't recommend it. So expanding a little bit more on the previous slide, here's some of the actual um, uh, properties that describe how to remove these uh, algorithms. So you can see on the very top line there, JDK DLS disabled algorithms. That would include things like SSLv3, TLSv1, TLSv.1.1, and so on. Or any cipher suites that are based on RC4, DES, um, triple DES, whatever. Uh, and then also maybe you've got some key sizes that you want to worry about. So you don't want to do anything with a Diffie-Hellman key size of less than 1024. So all of those parameters are in place for uh, TLS. Um, there's also some for cert path, which go down a little bit further. Um, let's see. Yeah, we can't stress this enough. If you decide to re-enable some of these by taking these off the list, um, you really should do so only after careful consideration of what you're doing, because you could be opening yourself up to uh, potential situations. Uh, we'll talk about more about that when we get to the crypto roadmap. So notice there are two different types of properties up there. There's one that's disabled, and there's also something called legacy. So our disabled algorithms basically mean that. If uh, this, on this list you can't use that as uh, either for TLS or for cert path uh, or for jar signing. Um, it, the legacy ones are kind of a last resort. We'll still allow you to use them, but you really want to think about updating those because on the next version of uh, JDK, we may actually put those on the disabled list. So um, for example, cert path RSA has keys less than 1024, they're considered disabled. But those that are less than 1020, excuse me, more than 1024 or less than 2048 um, are not as secure. You could still use them, so we consider those legacy. So again, those will be kind of your last resort algorithms. So in a previous slide, we did talk about um, the different sizes of keys. So let's talk a little bit more about that and get in more details. Often when an algorithm itself is not broken, crypto analysis techniques can be used and they're always evolving and uh, computers are becoming more and more powerful, so they might be able to factor in the case of RSA. Um, so a key size that was strong some years ago may be a problem today. So that's why we always need to continually update the default key sizes so that uh, you don't end up with something that could be easily broken uh, in a few years, say. So the default key size an algorithm is used when you generate a key or a key pair and uh, or maybe a signature without specifying exactly what size you want to use. So for example, in Java, if you uh, create a key, you can just say, give me an instance of this key generator and then give me the key. And so Java has to come up with its own default value. And so um, in that case, we have these various um, uh, uh, defaults. Before JDK 19, well actually it should be JDK and before, uh, JDK 19 and before, uh, for example, you had AES cipher at 128 bits. Well, in JDK 20, it's now 256, if allowed by this cryptographic jurisdiction policy files. Um, in most cases, uh, we, well, we always ship the unlimited by default, but some places may want to actually reduce it, and there's a way we can configure that as well. Um, so check with your uh, legal team to make sure that you're allowed to use the unlimited policy files by default. So. Uh, in the case of um, uh, ECDH, or uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, it used to be our default was 256, but it's now 384. Um, the ECDSA used to be 256 also, it's now 384. Um, the uh, message digests uh, used to be uh, 256, they're now 384, and so on. So um, that is about it for that. So the third principle that we wanted to talk about was the native integration, and that is mainly about using OS-level security features, especially those that are only available in the operating systems. So for example, Windows stores keys and certificates for either the current user or the local machine, and we need access to those. So some secret or private keys may have to stay inside the OS, so they're non-extractable. Um, so we have to call Windows to make those uh, keys or uh, certificates available for us. Um, so we do things using um, the MS CAPI, which is the uh, C API, or there's also cryptographic next generation support. Um, so we have some ways that you can uh, use those keys that are stored within the operating system. We do the same on PKCS 11 for most of the Unix type systems. Um, 
for and one of the other things on Windows is we also ac allow access to the login credentials that are available. So uh, they're stored inside of the OS itself, and we are generally not extractable to by default. So we have the GSS API available to uh, make people be able to log in and use that as a, a nice single sign-on experience. So we'll talk a little bit now about uh, some of the tooling improvements. Um, we've already talked about the disabled and the legacy algorithms. Um, so when these are used in, when these disabled or um, legacy algorithms are used in uh, uh, key tool or jar signer, we want to really pop up and say, hey, do you really want to do this? So for example, if you tr try to use key tool with the RSA algorithm and save really small key size of 512, you're going to get a warning that says, uh, do you really want to do this? Um, and the same thing with uh, the other one, if you bump up your thing to 1024, which is considered legacy. Well, it could be a security, you might want to consider not doing this. So that's uh, the improvements in key tool. There's also, um, uh, if the keys are generated without specifying a key size, we're going to use those new default values that I talked about earlier. Um, for the last bullet, uh, key gen pair. Gen key pair, excuse me. <laughs> they cannot um, uh, generate things like um, uh, for key pairs that are for uh, the X25519 or 448 or the Diffie-Hellman certificates because those are, surprise, surprise, those are not signatures. Those are key agreements. So what we need to do is we need to generate a certificate with those keys signed by another algorithm. And so that algorithm is now specified using gen key pair um, when you use the uh, signer and the signer key password uh, options. Similarly on uh, jar signer, um, we do pretty much the same thing I talked about when we talked about key tool. Uh, give you a warning when you try to use it. If you try to use a disabled algorithm or if it's um, uh, considered legacy, it says you might want to consider not doing this. Um, so let's see, oh, and also same thing like uh, key tool. If you're using jar signer and you don't specify um, a key size, uh, it will try to use the, the, or excuse me, not key size, but algorithm name. Um, it will use the, uh, the most current value of the default value that it, it wants to use. Uh, users won't be able to know if certificates are revoked. So one thing that we've uh, added was the ability to check for that. So you can now use the rev check option to direct jar signer to double check that um, the revocation status of the particular cert you want to use is still valid. So it makes a call, goes out to wherever the uh, database is and says, is this still valid? Yes, no, and then it comes back and does the signing. So lastly, we've uh, talked um, about the JDK CA certs file. That's the file that we have that uh, contains all of the trusted roots or trusted certificates. Um, so we have changed that from an old file format called JKS to a passwordless version of PKCS 12. Uh, so it's, uh, JKS was kind of an old standard that we developed 20 something years ago and uh, it was you know, reasonably secure, but uh, we just thought it'd be better to go off with the PKCS variant, which is a little more standard. So some things that you want to be aware of because of this new format is that um, the certificates are no longer encrypted because we no longer need to specify a password. Um, there's no MAC integrity checking on it, um, and you don't need to change the password from the default change it password, <laughs> which is uh, kind of surprising to a lot of people who have been around Java for a long time. Um, however, if you do decide that you're going to store sensitive information like keys um, or other such secrets, you really should create a password for this file. Uh, finally, we routinely add and remove certificates, root certificates from the uh, CA certs files so that we always have a reasonable default set of secure trusted certificates. So um, those will always be available for uh, Java applications to use. And kind of lastly for my section, uh, we talk about monitoring and there's been some great presentations today and there's gonna be another one a little bit later on. Um, monitoring is of course very important. We've uh, always or already supported uh, the Java flight recorder uh, recordings. Uh, we do things like provider listings and certificate accesses and recently we've added some more type events like uh, what third party uh, providers are being used and what security properties are being accessed. So the Java Management Service is an OCI uh, type 
service where it can actually tell you, uh, it will allow you to observe and manage your use of the Java SE features. And so you can look for discovery of um, what versions are being used, the usage tracking. Um, it can identify potential vulnerabilities if you're using an old version and so on. Um, let's see, so for more information, there will be a session at three o'clock upstairs. And, uh, oh, excuse me, 3.15. Uh, oh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's in the main room. Thought it was next, upstairs. Um, as for debugging, you can always set the java.security.debug flags or the javax.net.debug flags, which uh, can help uh, debug uh, JSSE. You can set those to various values to print out the uh, information about their respective areas. So um, it's also worth mentioning that uh, the TLS debugging is actually using a new JSON type output. So that might be useful if you're into uh, parsing um, the uh, output from JSSE. So at that, I will pass it over to Francis. Thank you, Brad. So I would now like to talk about the Java crypto roadmap. So we don't just enhance our releases with new security features. We recognize the importance of having a secure platform to run your Java applications on, whether you're running it on JDK 8, 11, 17, or the latest release. So that is one of the primary reasons we created this platform to inform the public of our upcoming security changes. So each change on the crypto roadmap improve security in some way. Uh, for example, we may be restricting or disable some weak algorithm. We may be changing the default to a stronger settings as Brad has gave us quite a lot of examples just now. And we may add support for stronger algorithm and such as when we added TLS 1.3 a few years back. Or we may be improving the tools to help you diagnose security issues. Again, Brad provided quite a few examples just now with key tool and jar signer. And each change may have some compatibility risk. So another benefit of the roadmap is that you get advance notice on each of the change. We do try to give a minimum three to six months notice. And we include testing instruction and details how to revert if necessary. Notes that there may be less notice in the event of a serious vulnerability and that may require us to make the change fairly uh, quickly. So with some exception, the changes are backported to all update releases. This will provide an equivalent level of security across our supported releases. So we do recognize that these are update releases after all, so we try to reduce the compatibility risk of each change as much as possible. We understand that some users may need to re-enable the stable algorithms to work around some backward compatibility situations. But again, as Brad mentioned earlier, know that if you do so, you may be weakening your security posture. So please consult with your security experts before making any of these changes locally. So here is a screenshot of our crypto roadmap on our website. The information on this uh, page is intended for releases currently supported by Oracle. So as you can see, each change will list out the affected algorithm or protocol, the proposed release timeline, and the instructions on how to test ahead so that you can find out if you would be affected by the change. It is important uh, to take action ahead of time so that you can mitigate any potential impact to your deployment. We also provide archived release changes so that our customers can identify when the changes happen. And that way they don't get a surprise once they upgrade and find out things don't work anymore. So instructions under the additional information column usually have instructions on how to revert any new default setting. And here is a recap of the changes we have made since 2021. So here are some of the new features we are working on. First, there are the CAM and KDF APIs. So traditionally, we haven't treated CAM or KDF as cryptographic primitives. Instead, they were abstracted 
using the existing primitives like MAC, key agreement, and key pair generator. But these days, CAM and KDF are more and more becoming fundamental pieces in higher level protocols. And they don't fit very cleanly into our existing APIs. They are being used in TLS 1.3, the uh, hybrid public key encryption, and more lately in PQC. So we decided it is time to start treating them as cryptographic primitives, and we will be providing public APIs for them. So next, Argon2ID is the new password-based key derivation algorithm, where user can configure many aspects of derivation, including how multi-thread is used, how much memory to consume, and how GPUs is used, et cetera. So unlike traditional derivation algorithms where the user can only provide a salt string and an iteration count, Argon2ID is much more configurable to make sure you get the most safety in your environment. The JDK networking team is working on QUIC, which is a transport protocol that operates over UDP and provides many desirable properties. They include scalability and flow control stream, low latency connection establishment, reliable packet delivery and network path migration, and along with TLS 1.3, protection for authentic authentication, confidentiality, and data integrity protection, which is why our security team is involved with that project. So next, LMS is a hash-based signature that has been selected for software and firmware signing for the CNSA Suite 2.0 advisory. And finally, there is PQC, the post-quantum cryptography. NIST is still evaluating various PQC algorithms in the standardization process. So in recent months, there's been some algorithms that's been chosen to be standardized. Some are still candidates, and some have been broken. So NIST is evaluating its fourth round candidates, and we are tracking that progress but know that we can only consider adding any of these algorithms after they're standardized. So when we talk about OpenJDK, it's not only that the source code is publicly available to everyone, but we want JDK to be developed by the community as well. And we also want to get feedback from our users and customers. So recently, we did a JZ survey as we are trying to find out what users think of our JCE offering. What do they use most? What is still lacking? And what would they like to see in future versions of JDK? We got many great feedbacks and we are seriously considering them. So here is an example. The question is, which feature in API do you use a third party provider for? And the top two answers are key format and PAM, which is privacy enhanced mail support. So now we are working on a new PAM format class that users can read keys, including encrypted keys from a PAM block file. We are considering standard PKCS8 and X509 keys, plus other well-known formats if it is des uh, defined as a standard. So please stay tuned for these exciting new enhancements. So this concludes our presentation. Thank you very much.